Well, hello, everyone. Here's another episode of the three Consulting Amigos. Today, we're going to take a look at driver number seven, which is investigate M&A and partnership opportunities. M&A, in this case, refers to mergers and acquisitions. And um, Ed today is going to talk a little bit about how, as a family-owned business, you can begin to look at options to give yourself a better chance of being able to migrate the business to a next uh, generation or to another owner. So with that, uh, would you mind taking us uh, along this path, uh, Ed? Sure, thank you very much, Ray. Before we get into the, uh, the content of, uh, of the presentation, I would like to say uh, we are uh, emphasizing what Ray has already said is that we're gonna be looking at our driver number seven we have uh, three consulting amigos have come up with eight drivers of value that should be considered uh, in any business opportunity one way or another. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, transitioning out of your business or purchasing a business. It depends upon which way you want to look at it. This could be for sellers or for buyers, uh, but I'd like to first focus a little bit of time talking about the people, family-owned businesses that are out there that, are up, that could be up for sale um, in the near future. And uh, I'd always, it's always good to have some um, data to refer to. And uh, there isn't a lot of data in this area, but in 2012, uh, Mass Mutual Life Insurance Company did a study of family-owned businesses and came up with... Uh, some observations uh, of, of these businesses and presented a report. And I'd like to chat about these, uh, these findings here for a couple of minutes and uh, uh, helpful, hopefully it'll help everybody articulate uh, some type of uh, future um, way of doing business and moving forward um, in, in dealing with their business or buying a business. So um, anyway, um, this study was done. Unfortunately, it's already almost 10 years old, so you got to take that with a grain of salt. And at that point in time, they talked to uh, the owners of family-owned businesses that were in their 60s. Well, that group now is, is 70, in their 70s. So uh, we have a lot of uh, stuff that's going to be happening here in, in the near term. The first observation they came up with, which was really intriguing to me, and it kind of fits what I've learned out in the marketplace, and that is 90% of the family-owned businesses will remain in the family. And I think a lot of people think that there's going to be all these businesses being sold to outsiders, and I just don't think that's the case. And I actually found some evidence from a study that supports that. And um, they are also, as part of the study, 85% of its successor CEOs will be family members. People that have family businesses, they tend to love their businesses, and they're not real interested in selling out because if they sell out, what are they going to do? So mm -hmm. it kind of makes sense that the majority of family-owned businesses will remain in the family. And we're looking at 10% that possibly could be sold to the outside, and and that's not as many as a lot of people are forecasting. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of people out there, a lot of um, of, of consultants and uh, um, service providers that think all these businesses are going to come up for sale, and nobody's going to know what to do with this big volume. I think we're moving, uh, we're transitioning in that direction with with 10 percent, but the rest are going to stay within the company. Within yeah, the and I think those are. It's a very interesting statistic. And I might just add that uh, we should remember that uh, you know a very small number of businesses are stay in business for ten years, uh, maybe five percent. So um, you've already kind of gone through this uh, culling era, and the ones that are ready to be sold are you know they're they're twenty years, thirty years old, and therefore they they have been successful businesses. So you're talking about successful businesses that are being passed on. And I think your comment is you're kind of right. There are a lot of families where uh, maybe the second generation has, uh, and I believe this applies to first generation uh, turnovers, but uh, I th I, the second generation grew up in the business. They work hard. They understand the business. 
and they sort of take over. It's a natural progression uh, to do that. It's a little tougher on the third generation because that third generation many times grows up uh, sometimes spoiled uh, and uh, maybe not in the business in the same way. Uh, the, the second generation didn't struggle nearly as much as the first generation did in order to make it successful. And the third generation doesn't remember that or doesn't have any knowledge of that. And uh, as a result, you'll find that, uh, that the third generation is usually when they go out of business because the third generation doesn't understand how to, how to keep it growing or transition or, or to even to maintain it because they're, they, they haven't grown up with the same work ethic as the rest of them. Very good. One of the other challenges I was going to mention, uh, Ed, is that if the company has fewer than five employees, uh, statistics now show that 80% of them will simply close their doors at some point in the future because a family member doesn't want to take it. And there, as you're saying here in the bottom, there is no successor. So it's, uh, it, uh, it reaffirms what you're saying. You know, the opportunity is not going to be as great as we'd like to think it is. And it gives us a chance to try to find people like I know Ron is from micro giants, et cetera, who might be willing to take over some of these businesses that otherwise are gonna close their doors. So thank you. I think another thing that the study has brought to everybody's attention is that most family owned businesses really are not prepared for the future. Yeah. Uh, they're focused on day to day. And you know, a lot of them think, a lot of the CEOs think they're going to live forever. Mm -hmm. by nature and live forever so they don't have an identified successor they claim they will never retire willingly i wait my might add and um and they this group now is close to 70 years of age so um that is uh that's that's quite a, a dire predicament here of where a lot of these family-owned businesses are in yeah and uh, so most are not prepared for the future. They have 55%, uh, according to the study, are, they do not do valuation. So they really don't know what their companies are worth. They have no effective buy-sell agreements in place to protect ownership and the company. 60% don't have a strategic plan. And if you don't have a strategic plan, your, your business is not optimized. Mm. 20, I found this astonishing, 20% don't have estate plans, and 48% rely on life insurance to pay estate taxes, and I, I'm telling you from what I'm seeing out, of field, out in the field is a lot of them don't have any insurance at all, mm -hmm. and uh, they, they think it's too expensive, which it is, but when something happens and there's got to be a forced transition of the company, there's no funds to, uh, to make it happen, to buy out the ownership. So it's a real predicament. And there's many risks associated operating this way. And there's many horror stories. Uh, you think everything is going fine when you, and your partner drops dead. And what happens then? Well, you might be in a five-year battle to keep your company because you're not dealing with your former owner anymore. You're dealing with his or her family. And they may have different aspirations and different objectives and different ideas on what the company is worth and what should be done with the company. So that's a real issue. So looking at it, turning things around, I think it's a great time to buy a company. Mm. If you focus on the right opportunity. And right. uh, so you should be out there looking because these opportunities are going to come up. And when something tragically happens and people have to move quickly, that's when you really find some real opportunities that really could make some sense. Any comments from my fellow amigos? Well, it's, it's, it's so true. And we've, we've kind of discussed the, the no planning for, for some time. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the many of these companies, as, we, as Ray has mentioned, d just don't have any plan. And so they get to the point to where they have very little uh, flexibility because they haven't determined what to do with it. They don't know how to sell it. 
they don't plan ahead to find somebody to sell it. And many times they just, they just are not saleable because uh, if it's still a small company, they, uh, the, the owner is the one who has, has the, uh, the expertise in the business. And if the owner is not there, there's no value in the company. We should mention that. But I think when you're talking about the, the number of companies that turn over to the second generation, you're talking about companies that have grown. They're probably 10, 20, 30 or more employees by that time. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to agree with you on that, Ron. I think one of the challenges is that they, um, the, the, the smaller the size, the more uh, it's uh, owner dominated, if I can use that term. You know, um, clearly an investor, somebody like us, really doesn't want to buy a company that we know if the owner leaves, there is no uh, uh, value in the business anymore because basically all the expertise goes with them. And I think we we had a bit of that conversation last week with the company that you were talking to, the engineering firm. So, you know, part of what we're trying to help uh, clients realize that, you know, if they, you know, if they can start working with somebody like you in, in Microgiants or somebody else, you know, they may not have a family member, but there are so many young people that are looking for an opportunity. It, it gives them an opportunity to continue on with the business and also uh, elevate some younger person into an opportunity. You bet. Well, I get right into the next point of the presentation. And what do you, if you owned a small business and um, if you're in your 70s, 60s or 70s, uh, what should you be doing? And uh, I think the number one thing on the list is to get some help, hire an experienced business advisor that can come in and help you with all the things, all the planning and all the due diligence that has to be done to get a company ready for sale or to transition into the next ownership, whatever that may be. You know, and the interesting thing, and I wanted to add this because I think sometimes when when they, they think of uh, consultants as an example, they, they tend to think of this, this very, ex very high cost uh, opportunity. But the truth is, you know, my experience, if you, if you hire the expertise, you only need them for a few hours. You don't need them for a full 40 hours a week. So the cost can be minimum, but the addition of uh, value is, is absolutely incredible. Yes, right. they, they, they take a look at the cost per hour instead of the overall cost against the benefit. And that that's yeah. a big problem. Yes. Yeah, we, with, with the right help and the right programs, I mean, your, your business could be worth 100 percent, 200 percent more than what it is right now. And uh, that gets right into the next point. You really should understand the value of your business and um, getting a valuation. Um, that looks at two components. Number one, it looks at what other businesses are selling for uh, of your nature in your industry at your size. It's very helpful you, uh, information to determine the value of your business. And then also looking at your future cash flows of the business and coming back with a present value of those. Those are two important ways of valuing a business. And uh, you should know what those numbers are because it gets right into the third point, and that is you need a strategic plan to optimize the business. So uh, before you go there, and I want to ask a question based on your experience and Ron's, when you see, a, when you talk to an owner of a company that we're looking at here, how many of them have a realistic idea of what the value of the business is? I, I don't think very many do at all. I think uh, no. they hear from, their friends, what they think the business is worth, uh, but very few of them have a real legitimate idea of what their business is worth. Yeah, I would agree. You know, they may they may be used to uh, looking at housing prices or, you know, the price of a building down the street and it's so many dollars per square foot or whatever, and they've got some sort of a benchmark and they can put it together. Uh, there isn't a benchmark really that's easy like that for, that, that I'm aware of for businesses. Some of right. them will say, well, there's a multiple, uh, and I think this is probably partially true, Ed, that you know, you've got a multiple of uh, whatever your income uh, is, your, your net income, or a multiple of your sales. Well, okay, fine, but uh, you're talking to your buddy and he says you got X amount of dollars. Uh, you know, and you talk to one isolated guy, you know, maybe, maybe two or three maximum who have, who they know 
who have sold their businesses and will tell them the real price and be honest about the profit in, the, in their sales. Right. It, it, it's not a combination that is very easy. So there's so little data. How in the world would someone know? And I would say no. it's much more complicated to understand the price of a business than it is real estate or something else that they're aware of. And, and the thing that I find in my experience is that the owner has, typically they see the value of the business from anywhere from 50 to 100% more than the actual value, right. the sales value is. Right, so, so and they always think it's worth more than it is, that, no yeah, doubt about right. that. And, and a lot more. <laughs> yeah, a lot more, yeah, right. Well, um, the, the value of the business is the ultimate uh, test is what the future cash flows are uh, of the business and taking the present value of those numbers. That's, that is really, that's the income approach. That is the number one way of valuing any business. And um, so that ties right into the next point. And that is a strategic plan optimizes the business. So it makes the business more profitable. And um, the other thing that's really important is Ron kind of touched on was the sales multiples. So if you're in a company that has a sales multiple of between three and four, uh, as is, that's one number you come up with. But think about if you double the profitability of the business and you increase the multiple rather than four to eight, think, just do the math on how much of an impact on value those two items can, can make. And it's based upon the value of the strategic plan and what the strategic plan is doing to optimize the business. And uh, those two, that, that's a very important aspect. And I don't know what you gentlemen think, but I don't see a lot of people doing strategic planning out in the field. No, no it's, uh, you, you don't see that. Occasionally they're out there. Um, along with that, I mean, it's, it's hard to find somebody who as a professional, really helps businesses do strategic planning, uh, small ones. Uh, you do find them that work for very large businesses. Uh, they can afford to, to make a living that way. Uh, but so you, you don't run into an awful lot of people that know how to do it. I think that's also part of the problem. I think you're right. And I think um, part of what we're trying to do here is using our collective experience to help you know, people who may not be able to afford that big uh, strategic plan, at least be able to look at some of the components of it and develop something that's meaningful and has value as they move forward. Absolutely. So we, we talked about the eight drivers, value drivers for optimizing the business and optimizing or reducing risk. But uh, another aspect that's extremely important is a succession plan, uh, migrating the owner out of the day-to-day. -day. We all understand the importance of that. Uh, sometimes the owner is the business. If the owner is not there, there is no business. You don't want to be in that situation. So you have to migrate away from the day-to-day -day activities as a business owner and become more of the chairman of the board. And um, also you've got to develop your management team to run the business as if no one's there to kind of watch their daily moves. Um, so therefore those two are very important. A lot of times the succession plan is uh, underutilized and uh, not thought of as well as it should, have, should be for the future of the company. Another thing that uh, is really important to separate personal assets from business assets. When you value a business, you, you make, make sure that anything, any asset on the books that isn't really bringing anything into the business should be disposed of. So, um, a lot of times with personal assets, get rid of them. Someone's got an aircraft uh, uh, on the books. Uh, probably it's for personal reasons. Get it off so it doesn't negatively impact the value of your business. So then, would, you say, would you say that, uh, kind of explain that a little bit more. If somebody's got a plane on their, on their, in their business, you're saying it would negatively affect it? Is that because somebody else doesn't want that plane? Well, the bottom line is, when you look at the value of business, you want every asset to be fully utilized. If you have a boat, I've seen a lot of boats on balance sheets that are hidden, called all kinds of things. Yeah. 
they're not really adding any value to the business. No, right. So they should be taken off and um, monetized some other way, and uh, it will improve the value of the business. So yeah. Yeah. that's kind of the point I'm trying to make there. And in in a in a way, does it 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 also changes the mathematical ratios? Is that what you're getting to? Is that you've got uh, a thirty thousand dollar boat on the business, and when you're doing the ratios, you're showing too many assets, and therefore it looks like your return on assets is too low, right? Yeah, exactly. That's what okay. I was gotcha. That's the yeah. way of putting it, uh, Ron, is sometimes people have vacant real estate as part of their business. Oh, and, yeah. And um, the real estate's a completely separate transaction. Right. And you want to take that off of the out of the company and uh, deal with it in a more economical way, either sell it or better utilize it, rather than having it sit on the on the books of the company. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. That makes a lot of sense, and and that's not immediately apparent. I think when you when you say you've got to get those assets off of the books. Well, that's because you want the assets to turn over, uh, and you don't want you don't want idle assets uh, really affecting the way somebody looks at the business. If it's not the core part of the business, you're you're right. The small business people, as you stated, they do that kind of stuff all the time, which which is fine, but it doesn't make any sense when you're trying to sell a business. That's true. No, and and it has all kinds of uh, uh, IRS issues um, that. Right that could be a problem down the road, especially if you're selling the stock of your company. Yeah, right, right. So cleaning everything up is really important. And uh, preparing an exit plan is important. It, it's usually a three-year process. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to realize the best price. You wanna sell or transition on your timing, on your preferred timing and to your preferred buyer or the person who takes over the company within the family. And it's a three-year process uh, to, for the best results. You don't do it overnight. It's gotta be coordinated with the attorneys and the CPAs and all the other service providers in the company for that company. So it's really important that it's done in that manner. So you need someone to quarterback it. You need to prepare the exit plan and you need someone to quarterback it to Sure you're optimizing your value. Yeah, and I think the point you're making here is that, you know, if if people could get into that three-year mindset, it really affords them an awful huge opportunity to be able to increase the value once you've got it defined so that it could actually be closer to what the owner desired as opposed to this fantasy that he or she had. Exactly. I think in, in ending this conversation, I, I think the biggest point is uh, very apparent, and that is that you need to have uh, competent advisors that are helping you optimize the company, improving the uh, sales multiple, uh, making sure that there's they've got the right potential buyers in the room so you get the best price. Um, that's really important. So you got to have a plan and you have to have some way to help you uh, execute that plan so that uh, you're realizing optimal value and things go the way you want it to go for the next uh, chapter of your company. Yeah. Well, that looks like uh, it was kind of a wrap. Uh, it sounds for me, uh, I can't, I want to get some feedback from both Ed and Ron. This is the kind of information that really is valuable, particularly for the companies that we typically work with that are small and really don't spend a lot of time analyzing this sort of stuff to make uh, an exit plan something that's a, an integral part of their business, not something they just tack on, you know, uh, days before they get ready to sell. Absolutely, and I think the, the last thing worth noting is that experience counts, mm. experience matters, and if you're picking a, an advisor, whether it's a legal advisor, CPA, or whatever, a business advisor, you got to have someone with the right experience that can drive these initiatives forward for ultimate value. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Well, thank you. Um, I think with that, uh, I want to thank 
both Ed and Ron for uh, being here today. It was a short session, but I think it was very impactful. And I appreciate, again, this opportunity to work together with the two of you and help uh, our, our business uh, associates become more effective at what they want to do, which is to exit their business with the kind of income and the ty type of uh, resources and uh, return on their investment that they were hoping for. Okay.